Daniel chapter number uh, six, if you will. Book of Daniel, chapter number six. I'll give you a moment to find it. We, um, as Christians, you know, there are <clears throat> there are things that a Christian should do, ought to be engaged in, ought to be involved in, and uh, from the from our earliest days in Sunday school, we learn. Uh, uh, what it, what ought to be important in the Christian life when we sing songs like "Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow," and uh, and it's true that we we need to read our Bible and we need to pray and we need to do both of those with regularity. And we've uh, been trying uh, to, uh, as best we can, strongly encourage daily devotions, daily Bible reading. Uh, for the past uh, four years uh, with uh, printing the Bible reading schedules on a daily basis instead of just annually questions of the day, things like that, and, and then uh, public Bible reading uh, from the passages of Scripture that we're reading for the week. Been trying to do that, and hopefully, hopefully we have been successful, at least in measure, in encouraging a more consistent study and reading of the Word of God. We've also tried, and we've been still looking for good ways to promote daily prayer. That's the other uh, of the two things that that we often think about as the necessary things for the Christian life to uh, be fruitful. We need to read the Bible, and we need to pray. Uh, But very often, we do not make time to pray. We do not schedule our time uh, to include enough prayer. And so I just want to do a brief Bible study tonight on purposeful praying. Purposeful praying. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter number 6, and if you remember, the plot that has been arranged to entrap Daniel. Because they are uh, the princes of Babylon, they're upset at Daniel, they don't like how he has been promoted, they don't like his position. Uh, God, by the way, it wasn't the king that gave him the position or the promotions, it was the fact that God spoke through him. That's what caused him to be promoted. You know, when we let God promote us, when we let God use us, we won't have to, you know, go on a campaign to get noticed. Uh, God will make sure that we get used if we are walking with him. And so Daniel had done that uh, as a captive, as, as somebody who has basically been ca- carried away as a slave, he has allowed God to use him in his unfamiliar surroundings, in his unwanted circumstances, and yet he allowed God to use him. You know, we get, people think, well, if, my, if I was in ideal circumstances, well, if you haven't figured it out, there are no ideal circumstances. Of it. Those jobs are already taken. I used to tease my uh, father-in-law. He was retired, and, and you know, I'd, I'd have to go off to work every day, and and I'd come home, and he's, you know, he's been doing this, and he's been doing that. And I said, man, I want to know where to sign up for your job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he says, oh, you can sign up today, but it takes you years to get it. You know, he'd say, say something like that. Uh, and so to get up on the list, you have to go years. But I just wanted to sign up for that retirement job where he could just didn't have to go to work every day. Uh, but but the, the fact of the matter is, the truth of the matter is that we need to, in whether, whether our circumstances are ideal or not, and they seldom are. We, uh, listen, there, there's a hundred places easier to win people to Christ than Superior, Wisconsin. That's the fact. But if we all went there, who would win people here? You know, the, the truth is that there needs to be a person in every place that is sharing Christ with a lost and dying world. Um, someone said that, you know, there are certain places. Montana was one of them. Uh, the Upper Peninsula is one of them. Uh, it's, uh, I've heard the same thing about at least two or three different places, that that's the place where Baptist preachers go to die. 
And what they mean, and what they mean is, it, it's hard to build a church. They don't mean physically die. They, they mean, uh, you know, it's just, you know, the, it, it's hard to build a church. It's hard to win people to Christ. And we live in such a place. And so uh, conditions are not ideal. Uh, but you find ways to accomplish the will of God, and you allow God to do something uh, that he will, and, and he will, and the evidence of that is that in a couple of weeks we celebrate 50 years of God's faithfulness. And so what we need to continue to allow God to use us, uh, but, that, but part of that is not just knowing God's word and serving the Lord, but also prayer. And so Daniel, in, look in uh, Daniel chapter 6, and they laid a plot, they made a plot for Daniel. They said we can't get rid of him based on him doing anything wrong because the man does, doesn't do anything wrong that we can see. Was Daniel perfect? I'm judging by the fact that no man is perfect to say no. He would not have been perfect. But they couldn't find any fault in him. Nothing observable in the life of Daniel. So they said we have to make his religion or his faith illegal or we'll never get rid of him. You know, um, we, we have been talking about this for this whole spring, about, uh, you know, shutdowns and limitations on church gatherings and stuff, about at what point does it become the limitation of your faith or the trying to regulate your faith. And some places in the country, uh, that has happened. Uh, and so, you know, we, it's been like borderline for many places, but, but there's some that have overstepped that and tried to make any exercise of religion or faith uh, a, uh, against the law. There's a church in California right now being fined at, uh, not only $5,000 a service, I believe it is, but also was just recently imposed by a, a different entity, a $50,000 fine, and, uh, and hopefully they're going to fight that. And, and win that. But, but Daniel, they, they said we've got to make it against the law for Daniel to practice his faith. And so they talked the king into passing a law that said no one can, you can't pray to anybody except the king uh, for this period of time. And, the, and that's where we pick it up in verse number 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he knew the law was passed. He was not um, ignorant of it. The Bible says he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now, that tells us this, that Daniel did not just start praying when problems came. Daniel was already a man of prayer. Uh, think about it this way. If we wait until problems come to begin praying, it's going to take us a while to get up to speed. But if we're praying all the time when problems come, we're already going at full blast. We're already hitting on all cylinders because we've already been praying. Just imagine sometimes, and it's not like this. It is, it, let me just say this. It's not like this. But sometimes my imagination gets the best of me. I wonder sometimes if up in heaven, if all of a sudden some Christian that never prays gets in trouble and they begin to pray. I wonder if when that comes to the throne of God, I wonder if, I know it doesn't happen this way, but I wonder sometimes, it just in my imagination, God have to say, well, just a second, let me get back to you in just a minute. I've got to look this up. Uh, what's it, Peterson? P, okay, uh, P, P, Peterson, Ralph Peterson, Rob Peterson. Uh, oh, oh, here he is. Yeah, yeah, he's one of ours. Haven't heard from him in a while. Just had to double check. Someone said, one preacher said, you know, for Christians who pray all the time, prayer is a local call, but for many it's long distance because they don't walk with God. 
because we do not keep a regular time of prayer. So when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he prayed, opened his windows. He didn't hide. He opened his windows and prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day as he did a four time. Oh, listen, we need to make sure we don't wait until there's problems to start praying. Let me give you uh, three quick th- thoughts about, about purposeful praying. Number one, we need to designate a place. He needed, we need to designate a place. He was in his chamber. Notice uh, his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. So he had a definite place of prayer. He had designated, this is the place where I pray. Very often, it's not wrong to pray on the run, but it's wrong not to pray at times or in specific places. It's not wrong to pray as you go through the day and God puts something on your mind, but it's wrong not to pray on purpose at other times. The value of having designated prayer meetings here at the church is because we actually stop what we're doing and we pray. James, the apostle James, historically, it's not in the Bible, but you read either. Did you know that you can find uh, some history on the apostles not in the Bible? I mean, it's not it's not the Bible, but there's some interesting things about the apostles, and, and again, some of it, is, yet you have to obviously understand that men wrote it. But it is interesting, some of the things. And one thing about James is James had a nickname. James the Apostle had a nickname. He was called Old Camel Knees because uh, he sa- it said that he prayed so much that the calluses on his knees became like camel's knees. And I, I don't know, I've never owned a camel Never smoked a camel. I've never, I, I guess I've ridden a camel at the zoo when I was a kid. But I've seen pictures of camels and those knees are all calloused and, and you know, they're, they're almost like, you know, just, just a, a thick scab almost on them. And James was called old camel knees because of the time he spent in prayer that his knees just became calloused and hard. Uh, he prayed toward Jerusalem. That's a common thing, to pray toward Jerusalem in that time. Why? Because that's where the house of God was. That's where the temple was. We don't pray toward Jerusalem because the, the veil has been taken down and we have access to the throne of God. And so when we pray, we pray to our Heavenly Father. When you pray, pray thus, say, Our Father. And so we pray towards heaven. Daniel looked toward Jerusalem and he prayed. Um, And so we need to designate a place. We'll never be regular in our prayer life until we have a place that we pray. And then we need a plurality. We need a plurality. If we're going to have purposeful praying, it's going to be more than just once. Daniel went and he opened his, the window in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Three times a day. Well, can't I just pray once? Matter of fact, a lot of times as Christians, we don't even, we're not even really sure why we have to pray at all, but since God knows everything. Just because God knows everything does not mean that he doesn't want us to bring our requests before him. He, he tells us to do that. Let your requests be made known to God. He wants us, by the way, what happens when a parent constantly just, you know, kind of that over provision of children, just everything they want, they, they just always have it without even asking. They lose connection with where it comes from. They think it just magically appears. You know, some teenagers, when they first start driving, you, you parents will thank me for this. Teenagers first start driving, they don't know to look at the gas gauge. Amen? Because they just think that gas just magically appears in the gas tank. They, they never, never had to think about, you have to actually 
put gas back in. Oh, oh, the, want to use the car. Oh, wait a minute. There's no gas. Oh, yeah. Guess you'll have to put some in. You mean with my own money? Yeah. You mean I have to pump it myself? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. It's come to that. But the truth is that, yeah, that's part of life. I remember our, uh, my pastor, Pastor Gwen. You know, when I was in Bible college, and, uh, you know, Pastor Gwen, he's from West Virginia, and he's just everything, he's, he's so practical, it's painful. I mean, just, just if you did something that was nonsense, you were going to have trouble with him, because he was everything but nonsense. And uh, he said, you know, uh, Bible college students, the church was way out in the boonies, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 miles from the edge of town is just out in the middle of the country. And, uh, and Bible college students, you know, every week there are Bible college students running out of gas, running out of gas. Late for class. Why are we late for class? Running out of gas, running out of gas. And, and Pastor Gwen would just get up and he'd just rip on us. You know, it's like, don't you have gas gauges in those cars? You know, how, you don't know that you're running out of gas? And, uh, and he said, you know, you guys, here's what you're doing. You're broke because you're college students. So you can never afford more than half a tank of gas at a time. So you wait until you barely make it into the gas station. You put a half a tank in because that's all you can afford. And then you go right down the fumes again. And every once in a while, you're just not quite making it there. He said, look, look, just get up enough money to fill it up one time. And then when you get down to half a tank, fill it up. He said, it's still, you're only spending a half a tank of gas at a time, but it's the top half, not the bottom half. It's like, oh, I guess that would work. It won't actually cost you any more because you're only putting in half a tank at a time, but it's the top half. So you're not just, you know, you're not quite making it there. Some of us learned that. <laughs> Others still kept running out of gas. Just, you know, there's no teaching some people. But, but uh, anyway, we need, a, we need to have a time. We need to have a place. And then we need to designate a time and have a plurality of prayer. We need to pray not just one time. If we don't take time to pray, excuse me, uh, Tom Williams uh, was a, uh, pa- he still lives uh, out west somewhere, I believe in, um, I don't know if it's Wyoming or where my wife could tell me, because we stopped by there. Remember, well, the Williams out there, we were on our way out west one time. Uh, we stopped at his home church. But uh, anyway, he's an evangelist now, and he just travels around, and he preaches on the subject of prayer. And I heard him several years ago, we had a group of guys go from here down state and listen to Brother Williams preach on the subject of prayer, and he said this. He said, don't take time to pray. Make time to pray. You don't take time to pray. You make time to pray. Adoniram Judson, who's obviously uh, historically was a great Christian, great preacher of the Word of God, he prayed seven or eight times a day. About every three hours, he would stop what he was doing, and he would go and spend time in prayer. Every three hours or so, he'd stop, and he'd go spend time in prayer. Um, by the way, I, I, have, I have a theory about that, and I, I've done a lot of reading uh, years ago, did a lot of reading of biographies of, of uh, preachers. Uh, he didn't start that after he became a well-known and very, uh, I want to say successful, but useful preacher of the Word of God. He became a useful preacher of the Word of God because he did that. He, he did not begin that regimen of prayer after he got busy serving God. He did it before he got busy serving God. You don't take time to pray. You make time to pray. The difference is some people know about God. Others know God. I read an illustration. I heard an illustration years ago about a man who would uh, travel around the country and had a photographic memory, 
and he would travel all over and quote things from memory. Anything that he had read, he could quote. I hate guys like that. But he had a photographic memory. I, I know some, I, I know, I, I had a preacher that I knew uh, that uh, had probably a near photographic memory. It irritated me. Because he could remember all sorts of things, and I have to just pound it in and pound it in. But this man traveled all over, and uh, if people would just stand up and request that he would quote, you know, the Gettysburg Address, or, you know, usually just well known or famous things. And if he had read it, he could quote it. He was, he was somewhere doing that, and an old man stood up and asked him, to quote the 23rd Psalm. And he said, if you will quote it, then so will I. And the man stood up and quoted it very eloquently, and he got finished. And then the old man uh, quoted it. And when the old man that requested it to be quoted, when he quoted it, there was not a dry eye in the auditorium. You see, the difference was, One man knew the verse. The other man knew the God of the verse. See, it's not just about knowing about God. It's about knowing God. And we will not know God unless we spend time with God. And so we need a place. And secondly, we need a plurality. We need multiple times of prayer. And then thirdly, we need a pattern. We need a pattern. We won't take time to go through it, but if you'll just look at Luke chapter number 11, one of the examples that we could pick, and I just chose this one for tonight, Luke chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 1, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we, uh, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He goes on and continues teaching about prayer, but that's usually where we stop in reading what we call, consider the model prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. This is a difficult thing. Because I look at that and I say, Jesus taught the disciples to pray. John also taught his disciples to pray. And the the difficult thing is that not only do I realize that we ought to pray, but we ought to be teachers of prayer. Not just Jesus and the apostles, not just John and his disciples, pastors and churches, parents and children. Uh, We ought to be teaching others to pray. One of the reasons that for many years, I don't even know how many now, since we started doing it, to divide into prayer groups instead of just having individuals pray on their own. We're, we, we haven't started that back up yet, but we're uh, trying to get some things light, lined out to um, actually start a prayer meeting again on Wednesday night. And so we'll be starting that hopefully very soon. But one of the reasons that we've done it the way we have is so that we can practice teaching others to pray. So that the reason that I met with young men is to teach others to pray. Not just, not just to teach them that they ought to pray, but Jesus gave an example. He gave an illustration of prayer. Pray like this. And that request was not out of thin air. They were, they were listening to Jesus pray. And when he was praying in a certain place, When he ceased or when he stopped, 
One of the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. That there ought to be something about our prayer life. That someone listening would say to themselves, I want to learn to pray like that. I want to learn what it means to pray, to get a hold of God. We need to be not just people that invest themselves in in a life of prayer, but also teachers of prayer, instructors of prayer. Not just the bare bones of giving an outline and saying, well, follow this pattern for praying, but to pray in such a way that others would be challenged in their heart to also want to pray. Ms. Wagner, she's praying with the young ladies so that she could teach them to pray. And as parents should pray with their children to teach them to pray. We ought to be instructors of prayer. Um, But to do that, we're going to have to be a people of prayer and be purposeful in our prayer. Purposeful prayer must mean praying on purpose. It means praying on purpose. It means praying with purpose. That's different. Praying with purpose is prayer to accomplish or affect a result. And that's we we ought to strive to be that kind. You say, well, you know, the thing is, you can pick up your Bible and I guess the difference is this. Let me try to illustrate it and then I'm done. It's one thing to pick up your Bible and read it. It's another thing as you're reading it that God is speaking to you. You're gaining strength, knowledge, insight, conviction, uh, help, whatever it might be that you're getting. From, it's, there's a difference, would you agree, between reading it and getting something from it. The same thing is true concerning prayer. You can just pray, or you can be effective in prayer. Being effective in prayer is not going to be done overnight. It will not be done casually nor carelessly. It's going to have to be on purpose, purposeful prayer. Father, I ask that you would help us tonight to let these truths sink into our hearts to become people of prayer, to add regular prayer to our daily routine. Lord, that it might be on purpose, that it might be, there might be a plurality. We might have multiple times of prayer. God, that we might have a pattern of prayer and follow the instruction of Jesus and learn the heart of it and not just the letter of it, but the spirit of it. God, I pray that you would help us to become that kind of a people of prayer. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God's good. Amen.